Following on from the previous video, we just got to the stage where we um, tested the radio and the conclusion was uh, sort of half-hearted positive. FM is, uh, is working, although very weak, but it's working, which is good news. Uh, the AM, um, very, very weak. As someone suggested, maybe the guy who did this mess messed around with the, uh, the IF transformers as well. But we'll see that when we come to that. The next stage that I wanted to do, um, because it is the most critical stage at this point, is to stabilize or check the biasing of the uh, output tubes. Now, what you see in front of you here are the components that I've removed from the cathode uh, circuits of the four ECL86 tubes, the power tubes. Now, um, what we have here are supposedly 47 microfarad capacitors. They're all reading wrong. These two, these two were the bypass caps on the, um, on the push-pull section of this radio. It has one push-pull and two single-endeds. The push-pull is for the main speakers, so these were on the main speakers. Uh, the corresponding resistors that went with that were one of these and this guy that's definitely seen better days. All right, um, so that's one set. The others were, this thing was locked on like that, okay? These two together, those two together. Everything reads wrong, okay? And I'll show you the result that we had here. We had, if you recall from the schematic, the all the bypass, uh, all the um, cathode resistors on those uh, ECL86s are supposed to be 170 ohms. Now this is what I got. 150, 185, 105, and 157. So we've got quite a mishmash of, of things here. Now if you recall, these two are actually a push-pull stage, which are supposed to be very well matched. Um, or you get some pretty heavy distortion, you get one tube working harder than the other, and this thing can obviously shorten the life of the tube, if not burn it out completely. This is crazy, okay? And the result of this mismatch um, is reflected on the anode voltages of those uh, particular tubes. If you look at this one here, these two are supposed to be at 255. They're at 249 and 258. So you got quite a discrepancy. It doesn't really matter that it's not 255. The more important thing is that they are closely matched. And the same is said for the uh, respective uh, cathode voltages. The cathode voltages should be as identical as possible. Now we've got a whole one volt difference between those two. Okay. Now, on the left channel, uh, on the one of the single endeds, we had 105 ohm resistor as opposed to 170. The resulting voltage is 237, um, and the cathode voltage was uh, one was 4.5. This is an error here. This is, should be 257. Um, the other one reads 257, and the resulting voltage. Is supposed to be five uh, was 5.2 these two bottom ones are supposed to be 5.9 those two are supposed to be 6.6 .6. so what i've done is i've replaced all of those and it's quite intimidating let me show you when you look at this mess over there it's quite intimidating to think that you have to go in there and solder a resistor and a capacitor uh, first of all you have to remove them and then you have to solder new ones on now, the only thing I can tell you about this is nothing's impossible. Just do it very slowly and very carefully, okay? And what I've actually done here, I'll show you on the other two. You can see it a lot better. What I've done here is I've joined the components together before putting them in. Let me show you the single-endeds. There you have the example of the single-endeds. Now, what I have there, that green thing, is a 180-ohm uh, resistor. What you cannot see there, but you can see on that one, is that there's a small quarter watt resistor in parallel with that. And I'll explain why in a second. And then in parallel with that is the bypass capacitor, which in this case I've used 10 microfarads, it's supposed to be eight, but 10 is fine, and they're identical. 
Now, what I did is I piggybacked everything together first, and then on the biggest component, which is the resistor, I've used that to tap it in or to tie it in to the respective points, which is on the top end there, ground, and the bottom end there is, I think, pin six, if I recall correctly. So those two are identical. And the reason I have that piggyback resistor on there, which you can see on the left one, and I have it on all of them, is that these resistors are 180 ohms. That's a standard value. This is a 2 watt resistor. And I could very well have left it at uh, 180, but I wanted to get it down to 170. And I calculated out that if you put a 3.3K resistor in parallel with that, that's exactly what you get. So what we have here on those two cases that you see over there is 170 ohms in both cases with 10 microfarad bypass on them. And these are pretty good capacitors that I've used on here. And in those two cases over there, we have 170 ohms and a 47 microfarad capacitor. So both of those have been done. The soldering has been carefully and neatly uh, done on those, contrary to what was done before. So we have both of those um, sections, or rather all three of them, neatly recovered, redone, fixed up. And what I want to do now is I have switched it on and I want to measure those voltages again. I want to measure the anode voltages and the, um, the uh, cathode voltages on these tubes and see whether we've got this down to where we want it and uh, whether we've corrected any problems. So we have the radio on. It's been on for a while, so it's heated up. There's no uh, lamp dimmer on there. It's drawing a steady 330 milliamps and the volume is turned down, which all we're getting is, uh, is hiss anyway at the moment. And I'm going to measure the respective voltages and fill them in here again so we can get an idea of what's happened. Remember now that all of them now have 170 ohm resistors on there. So if we look at the first push-pull one and we're going to read Firstly, the uh, cathode, the anode voltages, which are pin 6, and then the cathode voltages, which is pin 7. So pin 6 that's pin 7, 6.2, 6.3. So let's write that down. Pin 7, 6.3. Pin 6. 249. Let's go to the other one. 6.27. And let's read the 250. So 250. That there was a mistake. I was reading minus, I was reading the grid voltage. Okay, so that's on the push pull. Now let's look at the single ended ones. Uh, pin the cathode on the first one is 5.44. And the anode is 244. Let's look at the other one. Cathode 5.4. And the cathode is 244. Right. So what we've got here is a more stabilized system. We have very little difference in the um, in the two uh, cathode voltages 0 0.3 0 0.2 whatever it is the difference is negligible the anode voltages are practically the same which means the tubes are pretty well matched and um, the difference here is negligible as well so these are actually exact these tubes are obviously very well matched although they don't have to be because they're single-ended so they're driving opposite sides of of the cabinet, They're driving each a speaker on opposite sides of the cabinet. 
So um, we've obviously made quite a difference here. And what I want to do now is take this one step further and complete the actual uh, preamp stage so that I have the full audio stage uh, complete. And I was actually quite fortunate in that I found a connector, sort of things you get uh, lying around. This connector, this is a, well, this is a three and a half millimeter jack plug. It's actually got four connectors. The one nearest to the, the, the base there is usually a microphone if you have sort of iPhone type connectors, but it doesn't, it's not used here, but you've got your stereo connectors. And on this end, you've got the DIN five prong plug, and that connects exactly to here, which is our input for the gramophone. And I have checked that the actual connections from my stereo plug, in other words, the tip and the, uh, the ring, go to the respective uh, points over there where they're supposed to. Now, we do have a bit of a problem here. And this, again, is to do with the quality of the, uh, of the repair this guy's done. Let me show you. If you look at the, uh, this is the audio coming in should be from the gramophone. In this case, it'll be from an iPhone or an MP3 player or a CD player or whatever, um, if I want to use this as a power amp. And your signal comes in and you can just sort of see the left and right. Those two resistors there are to ground, so they act as your uh, input uh, grounding resistors. And then you've got two capacitors, and this is directly the first thing in the audio path. And if you look at the capacitors the guy's used here, it's bloody atrocious. It's pieces of crap that he picked up from a junk bin. These two should be amongst the best capacitors you can afford or you sh that you can get in here. In the least, they should be, uh, you know, a decent quality. But instead, they're sort of throwaways. Junk bin caps used in the audio path. So, you know... We want to keep this thing, we want to get this thing to a standard that uh, makes it really useful and makes it uh, a pleasure to play with and to use on a daily basis. At least that's my objective. We've got a, these two pieces of rubbish in the audio path. So these two are going to go as will most of the others, um, especially capacitors that are in the signal path. I'm not even sure what the quality is of these orange ones that he's replaced here, but um, I'm going to have to recheck them, and if they are in the signal path, I'll replace them. Um, you see, we've got things like that over there. That that almost seems like a throwaway capacitor from one of those, uh, you know, fluorescent d bulb things. You know, it's a 250 volt AC cap. I don't know what it's doing there. I don't know what's the what the purpose is yet, but I'll certainly check that out. So, I've got the power amp stage stabilized I believe power wise and consumption wise and bias wise so my next step is to move backwards in the circuitry to the point where I have my audio section completely revised checked and tweaked and uh, that's the next stage that I'm going to work on and that will happen soon and I'll report back bye for now